going on, everybody? It's your buddy, it's your pals, Pass Phoenix, the YWC Rally Check, here with your August 27th, 2021 AEW Rampage review. And before I get into the review, gotta be honest with you guys, as I always am, Rampage is has been a pretty good show so far. It wasn't as good as last week, obviously with the punk stuff. Uh, the premiere the week before that with Christian and Omega was a hell of a way to kick off the first show. I heard rumors or, you know, rumblings and, you know, backstage stuff that this show wasn't going to be as great because it was a pre-taped show. I completely disagree. I enjoyed this show tonight. Didn't set the world on fire like the first two episodes did, but it was still a really good show, really enjoyable show. Got a couple little nitpicks here and there, but I got to be fair because this show had an additional job to do tonight. If I'm a re if, uh, talking about me as a wrestling fan, me as a person consuming entertainment, as it were, because... Not only do I watch SmackDown before AEW uh, Rampage, uh, and I saw that premiere or the preview of where they're going with NXT, and I just like my heart fell out my ass a little bit, and I reacted on Twitter as I'm sure some of you have seen already. But also, take one thing that I like, which is NXT, which I'm really trying to cling on to, and it's not working, is it? Uh, the other thing that I really, really like is going to the movies. The theater's finally open for us up here in Ontario about five weeks ago. I've been almost every week except for SummerSlam weekend, and I went right after work today, so good times for all. The problem being is this time around, this week, I decided to go see Candyman. I'm, uh, I, I, I won't lie, I haven't seen the original. I was going in with no context, other than it was a bit of a fucked up movie, and it was based on a well-known movie, and, you know, slasher fun on a Friday, why the hell not? Let me be clear, and let me be as disrespectful as I possibly can. Disrespectful as I possibly can. Jordan Peele, and anybody that has even a single fingerprint on that movie can eat the dirtiest part of my ass. That was obnoxious, toxic politics masquerading as a B or C level straight to DVD barely slasher movie. I could have come home and taken a nap. I could have come home, I could have taken a nap, I could have been wide awake for SmackDown disappointing me with the NXT trailer. Um... I could have just slept until 10 and gotten up and watched Rampage. Let's be real. Um, no Lesnar on SmackDown either, which was a bit interesting, but we did get Becky, so maybe we get Lesnar Lesnar next week. And we see, like I said in a previous video, we see uh, what babyface Lesnar looks like. And I mean, Bianca Belair's already worked herself back into the women's title picture because, of course, she has. And yeah, not going well for me today, is it? I mean, the, the heat wave has stopped. The heat wave broke Thursday night, which is the only thing going for me on this on this Friday. So Rampage, as you can probably tell by my rambling, had a hell of a job to do. Bring my spirits back up, and plus it's fucking... well now it's 5 after 11 at night, so if I wasn't out doing something, I'd probably be asleep if I wasn't doing this. But, all that aside, all the bullshit, all the politics, all the NXT failings, all the me complaining about going and having a boring day at work. Aside, we did cap it off with Rampage, which was really good. Uh, as I say, uh, a couple little nitpicks here and there, nothing too drastic, and we'll get to those when we get to them. Started off with Jurassic Express versus the Lucha Brothers, the final of the Tag Team Eliminator. Now, I said to you guys, didn't I, last week, that I find these little mini tournaments for the number one contendership to be a little bit tedious, structurally, because... AEW sets themselves up as the ones that have the ranking system, the the uh, the scorekeeping, uh, as, as it were. And if you have somebody that is the definite number one, why do they have to defeat the number two, number three, and number four people to be the number one contender? They already are the number one contender. I don't really get that. That's been true for a while. That's been something I've been harping on for a while. It still does bug me. But look at the talent involved. I mean, first go around, you had Private Party and uh, Jurassic Express, who are who are two really good, really over teams, even though um, Private Party are doing the weird stuff with Matt Hardy right now. Let's uh, send a quick shout-out to Matt Hardy absolutely breaking his face on Dynamite. Not quite as bad as my boy Aiden Prince 
you know, Destiny Next Generation Champion, check it out for Spaz Phoenix Apocalypse, peeling his forehead open, but, you know, still, you don't really want to see it. And then you had Lucha Brothers, uh, as everybody predicted, beating the Varsity Blondes on Dynamite, and the, the Varsity Blondes might be racking up wins on Dark and Dark Elevation, but who's watching Dark and Dark Elevation? If you are, genuinely, and if there's something week to week to week that I'm missing by not watching those two YouTube shows, put it down in the box below. Let me know. Uh, I don't really... And Dynamite was weird uh, uh, Wednesday as well. But... Anyways, we get to the final. I don't know why I just lost my train of thought right there. We get down to the final, which is Jurassic uh, Express versus Lucha Brothers. Take the Young Bucks out of the equation, the two most over tag teams they've got in that company, bar none. And they deserve to be the mo the two most over teams, even if you include the Bucks in the conversation, but that's just my opinion, is it not? The Lucha Brothers get the jobber entrance, which is kind of shitty. Now, with this being taped at the same time as Dynamite, I don't know whether they filmed it before or after, or whether there was a timing concern or one of the entrances had to be cut. Obviously, stuff like that happens. I'm not actually harping on them, but I'm just saying Lucha Brothers are awesome. Lucha Brothers are one of your, like, marquee teams, and they've got a pretty cool... I mean, I don't like their uh, Death Triangle entrance as quite as much as I like their... whatever their entrance was when they first... Uh, when AEW first started, but that's, again, a minor nitpick. The uh, Bucks are watching on the ramp, as they have been for all of these matches. Phoenix and Jungle Boy, I gotta send a shout-out to, because you got two teams here that fit the... what seems to be the popular mold, and you can go across teams across the entire the entire spectrum. You can look at uh, a faction, like Hit Row in NXT. You can look at a team like... Um, the Street Profits on SmackDown, you can look at the Lucha Brothers and Jurassic Express here, where you've got, I mean, every, all of them are athletic, don't get me wrong, but you've got your your token, fast, agile, athletic guy in, uh, in not only Jungle Boy, but Phoenix as well. Obviously, Phoenix is fucking insane. And then you've got the guys that can do those same things, but are there to play the powerhouse role, which is, in this case, Luchasaurus and... and uh, Penta El Zero Miero. Now, somebody... Now, this is a total, total off to the one side. You can tell how what kind of video this is going to be. Um, Penta El Zero Miero is Pentagon Jr. is Penta El Zero is Penta M something. What is the deal with his name keeping on changing? Is it a, is it a rights thing? Is it a character thing? Is it a trademark thing? I don't, I don't care, really, realistically, because it's the same guy. It's given the same thing, but it's just... It's like getting used to Andrade El Idolo instead of Andrade Cien Almas. It's the same as anybody realistically. It's gonna it's gonna be me getting used to calling Daniel Bryan Brian Danielson, is it not? But uh Phoenix and Jungle Boy have a long stretch at the beginning and these guys are athletic as fuck and Phoenix is walking the ropes like he's walking down the sidewalk, which is fine. And they do their athletic smaller more high-flying, more agile shtick long enough that when the big boys tag in, the big boys tag in, and they beat the crap out of each other. And even though they're doing agile athletic stuff as well, they still come in as the heavy hitters, and that's and that's cool. It's showing that the big guys can do everything that the little guys can do, and the little guys can do some power spots in their own rights as well. Right before we go to the commercial break, all of them, all of them send out super kicks, which I think is really awesome. They didn't really play it up on commentary, but you got the Bucks on the ramp who do the super kick party, so all four guys fighting to get to them need to super kick the hell out of each other uh, as sort of like a, like a mental mind game type thing. It's 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 nice. It's a neat little touch if you choose to read it that way. The tandem dives by Phoenix and Jungle Boy on their respective opponents on the outside of the ring was awesome. Phoenix almost gets the win with a Guerrero tribute uh, frog splash, which was really nice. You love to see it. Um... He does it, but he doesn't do it in such a way that's just milking the Eddie thing. It's just, he, he almost does like sort of a half-ass, like Eddie Guerrero shimmy and then gets on with his business. He doesn't do the pose and wait for people to, hey, hey, look, I'm doing the Eddie thing. You need to cheer now. He just does it and gets on with it, which is really good. Somebody like a Sasha Banks could learn from that. Anyway, uh, rolling apron destroyer on the outside, on the edge of the apron by Penta, looked dirty. Always looks like it could hurt somebody. Double team pile driver on the center of the ring gets the win for the Lucha Brothers post-match. They get attacked by the Bucks. Jurassic Express, who they just beat, come back to even the odds. And that's a feel-good moment. But I will say, if you want to be nitpicky, and I don't 
care because everything here is kind of cool and it's kind of working. Um, five baby faces chasing away three heels is a little bit of a weird dynamic. Just a little bit. It doesn't really matter, though. It's, uh, it's very much like I said last week about the um, John Moxley, Eddie Kingston... Sting Darby Allen. It's just a bunch of people that are ridiculously fucking over, like hanging out. This time they happen to be hanging out, kicking the bucks out of the ring. Last week it was them kicking out, I think, what was it, Daniel Garcia and 2.0 and a couple of other things. So it does work. Um, I mean, obviously, uh, Jurassic Express is going to have to go and do something else. They're not going to be involved in, uh, in All Out. And the Bucks and Lucha Brothers, which is, I'm sure, the match that 99.9% .9 of the people watching this show slash listening to me wanted to see in a steel cage at All Out, is insane. I, I don't say this lightly. The All Out card right now is, if All Out is meant to be their WrestleMania, and I hate that I don't have anything else to compare it to other than WWE, but if All Out is meant to be their WrestleMania, this is like stacks on stacks on stacks on this card. Uh, talking about something we're going to talk about in a second, but as soon as you threw CM Punk versus Darby Allin on there, uh, Christian Omega, MJF versus, uh, versus Jericho, these guys in the cage, uh, Pac versus Andrade, uh, who else do we got? We got, oh, we got John Moxley versus somebody that I don't know from Japan think his name's Kojima. I think I'm pronouncing that correctly. Again, this is where I throw it out to you guys. Um, when I have Guapo on the show, when we do the preview, I'll throw it out to him as well because he's he's able to fill me in on stuff. I don't watch New Japan and I don't watch any wrestling from Japan. Uh, please fill me in on who Kojima is. Should I be excited? Is this just a filler uh, filler feud for or a filler match to get Moxley on the card or whatever the case may be? And then on the bottom of the card, you've got Paul White versus uh, QT Marshall, which I think I've said on a couple of videos now, is just so that AEW can have their own The Big Show came and knocked out a jobber moment. And I'm down with that. I really, I, it's, uh, I'm not going to say I'm super excited about The Big Show. I'm really not. Um, or Mark Henry, if he decides to step out of the desk at some point. But to see him there, to see him doing the commentary thing, and if he's going to step away from the desk once and knock out QT Marshall, because QT Marshall's a jobber. Let's be real. How was his little crew of people in the semi-main on Dynamite? How was Brock Anderson in the main event of Dynamite? No sh no shot at Malachi Black. Malachi Black's cool. How does Malachi Black not have a match at all? Out? Unless Cody Rhodes is going to come back next Wednesday and throw himself on the card last minute, which, you know what, even though you guys know how I feel about Cody Rhodes, wouldn't entirely mind that. We get a video package, really, really well done, on Punk and Darby. If you consider that all they really have on Punk is footage from his promo last Friday and his promo on Wednesday. And the promo on Wednesday, I will say, Punk's the promo guy, I get it, it's fine, he's speaking from the heart and AEW are letting him do it. Diminishing returns on the second promo, and I hate to say that. Y you hate to say that, but... Um, so basically, you've got the comeback, which was awesome, in Chicago, that wicked, wicked uh, response, everybody on Twitter being assholes to the dude that cried. To the dude that cried, good for you. I I couldn't care either way. I'm not going to sit here and say that I'm patting you on the back because I don't know you. That would be weird. But everybody that's fucking with you, fuck off. And apparently Tommy Dreamer wants to send you Bound for Glory tickets, so you'll be all right, I'm sure. Um, but what it means is they have a whole lot of footage of... Darby Allen and almost no footage of Punk because they have Punk arriving in Chicago and then Punk cutting a promo in wherever they were on, on Wednesday. And they still managed to make a really good hype promo out of it. And then we get Miro coming out to the ring to address the crowd. And he's dragging Fuego Del Sol with him. And I thought this was a really cool little bit of storytelling because he dragged Fuego Del Sol to the ring with him. Because who's the guy... Uh, was it Lance Archer that always used to beat somebody up on the way to the ring when, when he was first being introduced in AEW? And I thought they were doing a thing like that until I realized it was Fuego Del Sol. I realized that it was the guy that he faced uh, on Rampage before he was given his contract and all that sort of thing. Because if he beat Miro, he was supposed to get a title shot. Um, they did a nice, tight little bit of storytelling here where Miro's kind of offended that... Um, 
you know, Fuego Del Sol got to have his moment, even though he didn't beat Miro. Uh, and he cut a promo, I don't know whether it was last Friday or this past Wednesday, basically saying, how could you take that contract? You didn't beat me. You were supposed to beat me to get that contract. You got that contract, you know, because a couple people cheer your name and all that. I'm, a, I'm offended that, you know, you took a contract that basically means that you beat me without you beating me. I'm offended and I'm going to forgive you, but you're going to have to give something to me pretty much. He takes him to the ring and he forgives him again and then rips his mask off. And I thought that's really cool because he's doing this sort of like Mad King Game of Thrones type of, you know, and he's been calling out Eddie Kingston, who we're going to talk about in a second, but he's like, basically he's like, I'm going to let you go, but I'm going to take a scalp. And in this case, because he's a luchador, that scalp was the mask. And I thought that that was, I don't think this is going to mean all of a sudden a main event push for Fuego del Sol, don't get me wrong, but I thought that for a nice little couple of week, little bit of storytelling, I thought that was so cool. Miro got his scalp on his way to what is obviously his next opponent, his opponent at All Out, which is Eddie Kingston, who he's been calling out for a little while. Now, Eddie Kingston comes out on the rampway, he's got a microphone, thinks about saying something, just drops it, and they start brawling, and these dudes, I want, I don't want them to, like, go crazy with stipulations on the pay-per-view, don't get me wrong, it's not Extreme Rules, that's gonna be something we'll have to talk about another week. I would love some kind of no disqualification stipulation between these two, and just let them wail on each other. Now, I've got, as I've said before, and I will keep saying, Guapo and I are gonna preview uh, All Out next week, and when I sit down with Guapo, I'm gonna have a conversation, because there are some weird things to discuss about the the current Miro character but in the ring when that bell rings Miro versus Eddie Kingston is going to be a face breaker of a match they're going to make what happened to Matt Hardy on Wednesday look like child's play um read a thing recently about why Miro doesn't wrestle barefoot any anymore. Apparently he fucked his ankles all the way up when he was wrestling barefoot, and that was supposed to be his tribute to Amaga. So that's kind of cool. That's a neat little bit of, of trivia. So they had this brawl. Later on in the night, uh, Tony Khan came, came through with the news. Basically, what we make fun of WWE for all the time, okay, they had a brawl. It's official! Um, so I will say the, the, the counterpoint to that is they didn't, he didn't get a title shot because he brawled with Miro, Miro's been calling him out like, hey, come try to take this from me for weeks. So it is a little bit better than uh, than than how WWE pulls that same thing off. Now, I will say, between the, the video package for Punk and Darby and this segment here, there was a whole lot of time there where there wasn't any wrestling happening. Rampage is a one-hour show, and in the first two shows, they gave us the idea that it was going to be wrestling he heavy and segment light. If this happens every once in a while, right, because all of it was good, but again, all of this could have been done on Dynamite, where you've got a little bit more room to breathe. Um, I don't think you can afford to do this much segment package type stuff on a show that's only an hour long, especially when it causes the immediate next match to suffer. And this is going to be sort of the rock and AEW shoe because where they are falling down, I'm sorry, is still the women's division. And Tay Conte and the Bunny felt like an afterthought because they needed to squeeze some of these packages in. I will say, it's good to see Tay Conte back. I, I uh, it was a couple months ago now, but she put a thing out on social media uh, on the one year anniversary of her being let go from WWE when she was Tanera Conti in, in, in NXT. I don't know why I'm stuttering tonight so much. I'm really sorry for those of you that are uh, listening and trying to ignore me basically tripping over my own face. Um, but she's really, she's one of those ones that you want good things for. And I know that's sappy as hell. I really do. It's like I want good things for Layla Hirsch. I don't think she's going to be taking the title off of uh, off of Britt Baker anytime soon. She, I, I hear she's facing, uh, I can't think of the girl's name now, for the NWA title at Mickey James's weird feminist pay-per-view that's coming up this weekend. And good luck to her on that. I don't think she's going to win because, you know, it's the wrestling business and she's really, really so small. Um... But Tay Conte has the crowd behind her. The bunny, the bunny doesn't need to win because the bunny is already part of a recognized act. Um, they're not quite hurt so much by being part of the Hardy family office because Bunny and the Blade still go out on the show and sort of seem like they're doing their own thing. But she goes crazy in this match because the bunny 
wanted her to join the Hardy family office. She was making fun of her for being in the Dark Order, and the Dark Order's falling apart, and oh my god, isn't that sad? There's a whole conversation to be had about the Dark Order and and uh, the late, great Mr. Brody Lee and uh, potentially Bray Wyatt and ideas that people have about that. That's not something I'm going to discuss tonight, frankly, because I'm way too tired. Offered her a spot in the Hardy family office. She ripped up the contract. And then they had a really bad, really cheesy cat fight in the back on Dynamite. It, it, it's got to be said. Um, she gets her ass handed to her for the majority of the contest just because Bunny's being crazy. And I will say, Mark Henry on commentary, they're hyping up the fact that Tay Conte is a, a judo player or a judoka or a, a, multiple, a multiple belted martial artist. And they're hyping her up as this, as she's getting her ass handed to her. And Mark Henry literally does the, it doesn't matter if she knows karate, if the bunny knows karate. I'm like, oh, oh, there's only a few people that could get away with that. Um, eventually, she does get the upper hand, though. Uh, wicked, whipping series of judo throws across the ring. A few slams and a trio of pump kicks. Penelope Ford comes down the ramp, and we're going to get to why in a second, but she comes down, she distracts, the referee gets distracted, Bunny gets the knocks from Blade, knocks her out, gets the win. Now, this was everything and nothing, wasn't it? It was a, it was sort of a nothing match, it wasn't given very much time, it had a blah finish, it had... The, the implication is that Penelope Ford is got some sort of alliance with the Bunny now and, and the Blade, which makes you wonder where Kip Sabian fits into the mix, but also... It's just a big poster board for the fact that they're doing the Women's Casino Battle Royal, right? I love the Casino Battle Royal. I was actually, um, my brother has, uh, has sort of dipped back into wrestling, and I said, okay, you know what, don't bother with WWE, here's, here's what's going on in AEW and whatever, and I was explaining to him the concept of the Casino Battle Royal, and, uh, and how it's different from the from things like the Royal Rumble and all that. And I really do love the content. I know a lot of people hate on it. People I know that like AEW more than I do don't like the Casino Battle Royal. And I don't get it because it's such a it's such a unique thing. And you can't always just hang your hat on oh this is good because it's different. But it is. It it's it is good. It's, uh, I kind of like the fact that there's no real logic to like why who's in what group and whatever and. We we know at this point that twenty the the twenty one spot the Joker spot the wild card spot whatever you want to call it is always used to introduce somebody new and then we immediately get disappointed because the brand new person that we're all excited that we didn't think was ever going to be here doesn't actually win the match which is fine and then they did the casino ladder match and they actually gave it to uh, didn't they give it to Brian Cage when he made his debut the casino battle royal or so the the casino ladder match was strange. I'll give you that. But I like the Casino Battle Royal. I'm going to say it here. And I'm probably going to say it next week when I talk to Guapo and we actually properly preview this show. I have heard and I really hope that it's Ruby Soho. I really do. Um, rumors as well that uh, that one of the other entrants or one of the other surprise people in the match could be Mercedes Martinez. I'm down for that. But she's been there already. And we have seen her do some cool shit. Even when she was in WWE, she got to do some cool shit. She got to get into Retribution and then avoid that whole car crash. What did they ever do with Ruby Riot? Now known as Ruby Soho, formerly known as uh, Heidi Lovelace. Um, I would really love to see her win. I really would. Because Ruby Soho versus Britt Baker is a match I could get into. I said it before. Um, when people said, oh, is Charlotte Flair going to go over to AEW? And I said, you know what? Her dad's probably going there. Her her boyfriend's already there. If she went over there, that's cool. I don't want her to get a title shot. I don't want her squashing Britt Baker. I want her to have great technical matches with the likes of, you know, Hikaru Shida and Thunder Rosa and uh, Serena Deeb. Charlotte Flair versus Serena... Or, or, I guess she'd have to be like Ashley Flair uh, versus Serena Deeb on the undercard of a pay-per-view would be fantastic. But character-wise, give me, give me Ruby Soho versus Britt Baker for that title in, like, three months from now when they do their next pay-per-view. I will be a happy, happy guy. This, this was the same, though, 
in January as a couple people randomly trying to build momentum before the uh, before the Royal Rumble. It was everything and nothing. Like I say, I like Take Conte. I like the bunny too. Don't get me wrong. Uh, my focus was on Tay Conte because again, uh, Babyface. I've I've heard a little bit of her backstory. I want you know you want you want to see good things for people. You know if if they're not in a title match, you want to see them in a in a good mid card spot. I guess put her up against uh, put her in a feud with uh, Red Velvet or somebody like that, or um, what's what's her name? Hater the the new big heavy for for Britt Baker or get Rebel is Rebel actually injured or is that a shtick? Get Rebel Rebel versus Tay Conte as, as an undercard match on a pay per view make would make me a happy guy. I like Tanera Conte when she was in NXT and I agreed with everybody when I said they should have used her more. Moving on. Omega and Cutler versus Christian and Kazarian is your main event. And basically, I really like Kazarian. I really do. Uh, Kazarian is one of those names that I remember when we talk about sort of like the golden age of TNA before WWE like looted 90% of their good talent, Samoa Joe and AJ Styles, etc. Uh, Christian is sort of the feel-good story right now. He's, uh, he's the championship challenger on a card where people are worried about other matches other than the title match, which is a really awkward spot to fill, and he's doing that pretty well. And he's carrying around the Impact Championship as sort of a consolation prize. Brandon Cutler is a goof. And Omega and, and Cutler come out with Nakazawa and with Callus. Obviously, Kaz beats the shit out of Cutler to start the match in his Zebra Zubaz suit, which is fantastic and wonderful. You play the typical cowardly heel, and Kenny Omega short arms him a couple of times. Uh, not wanting to get in the match, only gets in the match when Nakazawa gets a cheap shot in at Kazarian. But the cool thing about that is when Kazarian gets the hot tag, Omega sells the hot tag to Christian like it's death, which is which is great. And I will say, Omega in this match was really, really cocky, really, really good, really, really um, good at be going from being super cocky to almost scaling out of the ring. He did have a, a really cool maneuver at one point in the match, and I don't know why this stuck out to me. I really don't, because there was better spots in this match, there were more effective spots in this match, but at one point in the match, when he was having a back and forth with Kazarian, he just grabbed him by the face, basically like he was pie-facing him, and sort of pushed him down to the ground. It wasn't it wasn't a ch like a choke slam because there was no lift, but if you imagine... If you imagine Undertaker doing a choke slam but with no lift, he basically threw him to the ground by his face and it was it was a uh, it was a transitional thing it was g gone in a snap and i just thought that's hilarious because the immediate first thing i thought is all the basketball stuff that uh the super elite have done and it just looked like he palmed his face like a basketball and that made me chuckle so omega who i'm critical of at the best of times made me chuckle and then he v-triggered his own partner for reasons and then bailed on his partner that he had just v-triggered spear kill switch on cutler by christian christian and kaz get the win now we know where christian's going christian's going for omega at all out he's not gonna win that's fine we can talk about that as we talk about it they have to do something cool with Kazarian. Because Kazarian is different than every other person that's feuding with uh, with the Elite. I mean, we know that they're the reason he can't team with Daniels anymore, and Daniels isn't really wrestling anymore, to the best of my knowledge, unless he's... Tell me if he's wrestling on Dark or Dark Elevation, because I'm not seeing that shit. But um, him transforming into this, this Elite Hunter character, and the commentary even co uh, coined the phrase that he's like AEW's Punisher... I think it's a really cool thing, I think he's pulling it off really well, but it makes him different from every other person that's going after the Elite, because, yeah, Hangman Page has his personal problems with Kenny Omega, but he's going for Kenny Omega's title. Christian is the number one contender and has already taken one title off of Kenny Omega, and he's going for another one. The Lucha Brothers are going after the Bucks titles. The Dark Order went after the Good Brothers titles, so they're, they're taking their little bites or they're taking their particular prizes that they want off of the super elite whereas Kazarian wants the group to fall like he wants he, his his scalp is the whole group we talked about scalps earlier with Miro and taking the mask and all that sort of thing his scalp is the whole group he and I hate to make a really really lazy Marvel comparison but if you think back to 
uh, Captain America Civil War, when the argument between Tony Stark and Steve Rogers is actually started by the manipulations of Baron Zemo. Baron Zemo knows that he's just one guy, he can't compete with the, with the Avengers, and he sort of has to make them crumble from within because he wants to destroy, he wants to be the one guy that destroyed them all. I don't know why I'm waving my hands about it, it's tired in here. Frankie Kazarian kind of needs to have a moment, because his moment isn't going to be winning a title off Kenny Omega. As much as I'm a fan of Kaz and as much as the dude is underrated as fuck, his moment is not going to be taking the AEW championship off of Kenny Omega. And he's not a tag team wrestler anymore, so he can't take the title off the Bucks. He can't take the title off of uh, off of the Good Brothers. Uh, the TNT championship isn't in the realm of the super elite right now unless Miro joins them, which would be really weird and sort of out of the blue. They need to do something with it. He needs to get a big scalp off of the off of the super elite and i don't know what that scalp is i don't know what that metaphysical trophy for him is going to be because it's not going to be a title and this is a group right now that's revolving so much around basically having all the gold except for the tnt championship and the beautiful diamond ring um so it's a really it's a really weird sort of conundrum it's a really weird sort of paradox because they've got something really good with kaz but I don't think they know what his end... Pro I don't know, like, we don't know what his brass ring is, is, is the best way I could say it. Yes, once again, stealing a line from WWE, but I find it appropriate here. This wasn't a bad show. Uh, I, and again, I say what I said at the beginning. Apparently, this was pre-taped. I don't know. The crowds still seem pretty hype. Uh, having Cutler there as Omega's partner made the last match a bit of a comedy match. Uh, because he was actually in the match, he wasn't dousing everybody with the cold spray, which is a gimmick that's getting a bit old. They need to treat their women's division better, is the easiest way I could say it. You can't do package after segment after package on this show every week. Uh, they kicked it off with the Jurassic Express versus the Lucha Brothers, which was fantastic. Lucha Brothers versus the Bucks in the Steel Cage, excuse me, at All Out, is going to be fantastic. My feelings on the Bucks aside, I'm never going to doubt what they can do in the ring, and specifically what they can do in the ring with the Lucha Brothers. So this this show, as I said... It wasn't the Punk show. It wasn't the Impact title on the very first episode. This was the first sort of normal show, if that makes sense. And if this is what their this is what a normal show is going to be for Rampage, I think we're in pretty damn good shape because I, I need to focus on something, and it's not going to be NXT because NXT is slowly going to rip my heart out. I think, and as I've joked on Twitter, as I've joked to both Jake. And to Guapo, I may have to jimmy up one of those graphics very, very soon that says, your buddy, your pal, Spaz Phoenix, the YWC reality check is all elite. Maybe. Subscribe up there. Talk down there. Start a conversation. Keep all these conversations going. Don't be a stranger. I will talk to each and every last one of you later. But for right now, I am tagging out. Bye, guys.